Hi everyone, my name is Lucian. Most of you know me from Twitter as Triangle Investor. And today I'm pleased to have one of the most respected CEOs in Uranium business, Mr. Steven Roman from Global Atomic. Global Atomic is a near-term uranium producer with projects in Niger and uh, assets in Turkey. Uh, Mr. Roman, welcome to my show. Lucian, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. The pleasure is all mine. How are you, sir? Busy year for you. It's it's a very busy year. That's right. Yeah, I wish yeah. the uh, I wish the markets behaved a little better and recognized uh, the the value, but I'm sure it will come at some point. I believe so. Uh, for those who do not know you, can you give us a brief introduction of who is Stephen Roman? What's your background, and how did you get involved in the uranium business? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, really, I grew up in the uranium business. My father emigrated as a 16-year-old to Canada uh, just prior to the war from uh, eastern Slovakia. And uh, he uh, decided, I guess, to get into the prospecting business, looking for minerals. And yeah. he discovered the, the world's largest uranium deposit uh, in Northern Ontario and built a company called Denison Mines Limited. So yeah. Denison was, uh, I guess, at one time, the world's largest uranium producer. And of course, he built the town of Elliott Lake. There was uh, another company there, Rio Algom, yeah. uh, that had a number of uranium mines. But that's really where I got started. I went underground with my father when I was five years old, when they were building the uranium mine in Elliott Lake. And when I was uh, old enough to start working underground, which was uh, 19 at the time in, in Canada and in Ontario, I started working as an underground miner in the uranium mine. So I went yeah. through the training program that's dictated by the province, uh, received my certificate, a uh, miner's certificate and, uh, you know, really then operated uh, in the mine and took geology in school, uh, of course, then progressed through various departments in the company until I became the vice president of exploration. So then I was out to doing projects around the world. Uh, and uh, in 2005, I started my own company. My father had died in, in 1988. And uh, a lot of the management and the board changed yeah. at Denison. So I went out on my own. And just at that time, uh, Niger was opening its doors for new foreign investment. Yeah. So we went to Niger uh, and studied old records from the mines department to find find prospective properties where we could do exploration. Yeah. Niger, of course, was a big uh, uranium producer, but very underexplored. So we uh, picked up uh, six concessions, six permits, and we, we now actually have four uranium deposits in the country. But at the end of 2010, we discovered the, the DASA deposit. So that was a, a Greenfield's discovery made by our crew in the uh, in the country that uh, initially we did airborne work, we did ground uh, yeah. geophysics, we did geochem, um, and then we found an area that looked very prospective, and that was at the end of 2010 when we discovered that big deposit. Yeah. So. Lucian, at the time, uh, you know, uranium was looking better. It had it, been very high in 2007, then it came off. And then in by 2010, 2011, it started coming up again until Fukushima happened. But we were lucky in that when we made the discovery, we had JP Morgan, Macquarie Bank, Investec. They came in out of London to support the company and put money in. That really allowed us to put eight drill rigs on the property and drill off what what's now the the largest highest grade uranium deposit in Africa. So we moved through a, a very difficult period from the time of Fukushima. Uh, for ten years, there was there was no demand. Uh, there was very little money available for uranium exploration. 
but we kept things going with with the money from these big investors as well as yeah. combining with our zinc project in Turkey, which is another company I started. So it's all worked out, and now uh, the mine is uh, fully permitted, and uh, we have offtake agreements with utilities, and we're building the project right now. As you say, Lucian, yeah, will be one of the first uh, producers out there to to start supplying yellow cake in 2025. But also, this is the only green fields uranium project in the world right now. Agreed. Great overview, Stephen. Uh, before we touch on company developments and projects, I would like to hear your comments about the news from yesterday, uh, where Namibia is considering taking minority stakes in mining and production companies, especially given the fact that you run a company where uh, government has 20% stake. Uh, what's your take on this? Well, you know what? I think it's it's people have to look at at this situation broadly around the world. So even in Canada, the government has big stakes in these projects through the royalty system that they have in place. Yes. Uh, and it's the, the, the royalties are very high in Canada. Uh, Niger, uh, they have in West Africa, typically all the governments get a 10% free carried interest. Uh, they have an election where if they fund, they can go up to 40%. The Niger government chose to fund 10% in addition to their 10% free carry. So they now have signed an agreement with us for 20% interest. Yeah. And that's how we're operating. In Namibia, uh, it might have been a little different. Maybe the government didn't have that type of an arrangement uh, with the companies going into the, into the deal. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a lot of pressure from local people that hey you know we don't we don't want projects to be developed with really no benefit to the country we we need to have some ownership in the projects namibia is now talking about it we don't know yet what they want to do yeah but of course this has scared everybody in the market it scared everybody in the uranium market now all the uranium stocks have gone down yeah, because yeah, everyone did. thinks that uh, you know these governments are going to start taking away projects. I had one investor call me this morning. They said, "Oh, they heard that they're going to take away our projects." I said, "No, come on, <laughs> this, this is this is just yeah. crazy." I mean, the government has a, an equity stake in the project. They're putting up money in the project. They're supporting the project. Uh, you know, there, there's no incentive for governments to to take these projects over because they need the capital from outside. They of need course. the expertise from outside to to actually finance and develop these projects. And then, of course, they have their tax regime. You know, you're operating under a mineral code. You uh, our corporate tax in Niger for our local company is 30 percent. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then they have a royalty system as well on all the pounds you produce. So they're very well compensated uh, and in addition to their direct ownership. Good point. Uh, I asked Daniel Major from Gobiex the same question uh, when he was in my show recently. Uh, but I want to hear it from your corner. Uh, you are attending a lot of conferences. And uh, what is the feedback from utilities, fuel buyers and brokers about demand supply story for uranium? And where do they see uranium price going in the next two or three years? Well, I was just recently in The Hague uh, for a big fuel buyers conference. And, and frankly, Lucian, I've, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, uh, there's there's such a a bullish uh, atmosphere, a very positive atmosphere uh, for the whole nuclear industry now that has never been here before. Uh, of course, nuclear supplied in the past about ten percent of of world energy needs, but now with uh, climate change uh, ideas and the fact that. I would say all of the countries that were represented at the Hague conference 
were all stating they want to be net carbon zero by 2050. Okay. So to achieve those goals, nuclear is going to have to supply the base load power for all of these countries that want to eliminate carbon production, which means that from 10%, nuclear needs to go up to at least 30%, which, which is a massive increase in power produced from nuclear. I think everybody now has realized that renewables, uh, although I believe they're a good thing, uh, yeah. solar, wind, et cetera, yeah. but it can't provide your base load power. It's very unreliable. Uh, it's good to have it in your overall mix, but nuclear now is gonna form a much bigger component and the reactor builds, the nuclear reactors that are being built around the world right now, is just accelerating. Yeah. And this is not taking into account the small modular reactors, which we were told in The Hague, there's now hundreds of orders for small modular reactors. So yeah, there's a, a number of competing companies that are uh, trying to uh, have their technology approved by the nuclear authorities. And eventually there'll be probably a half a dozen companies that succeed with their designs, but they're going to be supplying these small modular reactors to various countries, industries, et cetera. Um, and there's, that's not been factored into the <laughs> uranium supply. So to get back to your question about what do the utilities think about the supply yes i think the utilities are now uh clearly getting to the point where they're starting to get nervous about where is the uranium going to come from i know that there's still a lot of talk about the enriched uranium and uh, with russia potentially being taken off from uh, the supply base where is the enriched uranium going to come from? But the question I asked, well, the enriched uranium is one thing, but you need the primary natural uranium, U308, to supply the converters to make the enriched uranium. So mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the utilities need to focus on where are they going to be buying their uranium supply. And there's really not that many places you can buy it. The United States production is very small. Australia is very small. Kazakhstan just sold 50% of their production to the Chinese. Africa, most of the production is going to the Chinese. They, mo they own most of the mines. And uh, you've got Canada yeah. uh, with a couple of good projects that are now on the books to be developed. But it takes years to develop these projects. Uh, they, they don't have their permits yet. And uh, once they're permitted, of course, then you need to finance and build these projects. So the, the shortage of uranium that's coming here, it seems, uh, Lucien, is going to be very, very big. Uh, there needs to be a lot more uranium mines developed. But you have to find the deposits first. Yeah. And that takes some time. Of course. I mean, people need to realize that it's it's at least at least a 10-year process, if not 15 or 20 years, to discover and develop a new uranium mine. It's a long time. But it's much easier and faster in Africa. Well, right? I would say it's probably easier from a permitting point of view. You still yeah, have I mean to that. find the deposit and you, you could be spending <clears throat> 10 years looking. Of course. I mean, course. you know, that they don't just stick out of the ground. You have to look for them. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Stephen, let's get to DASA. How is the construction going? DASA is going great. Uh, there's uh, almost 200 people at site right now. <clears throat> We're expanding our camp. Uh, we'll have the construction camp first phase uh, coming in in the next few months right. with all the uh, buildings to house the construction team. Uh, right now, the uh, the mine is being developed. Uh, the ramp is down uh, over 400 meters now. We have about another 400 meters to go to get to the top of the ore body. Yeah. Uh, so that ramp is about, oh, 800 to a kilometer long. 
uh, and then it hits the top of flank zone, and then yeah. we start doing the the level development. So that's that's progressing well, and uh, the earthworks have started now. So we're building uh, and preparing the ground for the civils, <laughs> the the pouring of the cement for the foundations for the plant, uh, and that the cement work would start to. Uh, towards the end of uh, the next quarter, early the following quarter. So by the end of this year, we will be starting to receive uh, components for the plant on site. And then of course, next year, all your civils will be done, earthworks completed. The mine will already start producing ore by the beginning of next year. And so it's a big, uh, construction project during 2024 so that we can start delivering uranium in 2025. Okay. Uh, you recently updated DASA mineral resource <clears throat> estimate. Uh, can you give us some detail about it and uh, what does it mean for the future production and mine life? So if people recall, uh, we had um, our mining broken down into phases. So phase yeah. one, which is what we did our feasibility study on. That was a 12 year mine life doing about 44, 45 million pounds of production, about four and a half million pounds a year. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what this new uh, updated uh, mineral resource estimate has shown us, and we, we uh, the first model, we used some open pitable material as well as underground material. So it was a bit of a blended mine design. Yeah. However, the, the the design for the feasibility was all underground. Mm -hmm. But what we did now is we uh, eliminated all of the the open pitable material. <clears throat> and with this new update, if people look at it, we now have uh, 109 million pounds in the indicated category and another 40 to 50 million in inferred. But the grade has come up significantly. So uh, whereas the previous one using open pitable was about 1,700 ppm, yeah. the, the update is at about, let's say, 5,000 ppm. So that's, that's eliminated yeah, that's... that lower grade open pitable yeah. material. Now we're focused on the underground. And what that's going to do, because of all this moving into the indicated category, we will be able to now use that update yeah updated resource in a new mine plan so we will be updating our feasibility study by the end of the year and a lot of that material is going to be translating into a mineable reserve which is going to have a big impact on your mine life and uh and also uh i would expect your npv and irr because uh the press release we put out showed a, a longitudinal section and you could see how much of that initial inferred re, or uh, yes inferred resource has now been bumped up in categories to indicated and of course then that'll all move into or most of it into a mineable reserve so that the mine life will be extended substantially yeah and of course that'll allow us also to depending on the market we may even be able to increase our production profile if if required, if we have enough sales. Excellent news. That's great, Roman. Steven, uh, let's get to project financing. How much money do you have now in the bank and how much more money do you need uh, to bring this project to production? And please give us uh, details of how are you going to do that? Okay, so at the end of uh, Q1, we had 52 million. Uh, cash and uh, so we're using that now uh, you know obviously for our underground development surface infrastructure and starting all of the works for the plant yeah um, we expect to announce uh, banking terms with the Canadian and U.S. banks by the end of this quarter so the the deal generally is a 60-40 debt equity deal I can't release terms at this point until they've agreed to these things. Of course. But uh, what what we need to find out before we can really, um, I would say, formulate 
the final amounts that would be required is how much uh, additional capital the banks might require for an overrun facility, a working capital facility, mm -hmm. interest payments. So once we have all those numbers and we have it nailed down, we will also be receiving, of course, all the final capital costs. So that's something very important I think everybody needs to understand is everybody's saying, well, listen, you were going to raise 100 million, you raised 56. Yeah. So you have this you have this equity hole that you need to plug. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think uh, until we find out what exactly we need, it's sort of hard to to tell people this is exactly how much we need to plug that equity hole. I mean, the bank debt, once it's formulated, once it's there, once we've signed the, the paperwork, the bank debt is available. So all the banks will require is that before you start drawing down debt, that you've covered all of your equity requirement. And it could come as a, uh, as, as we are now with that we have enough money on board if we require more money yeah then it could be uh through a potential offtake agreement uh, we have we are speaking to people uh they're not utilities they're more carry trade mm -hmm. that are interested in buying uranium from dasa and they're okay. willing to give us prepayments so we have that option we have an option of doing a short-term bridge facility we have two or three groups that are interested in doing that. So what we're trying to do, and as a big shareholder, I, I, I always like to minimize dilution. But at the end of the day, we have to assess how much money is required once we have all of these other unknowns in front of us. Yeah. yeah. And then how much, how much additional money do we need to raise? And then we can be more specific on what to do next. Yeah. Uh, we touched uh, you, uh, on the offtake agreements. Uh, you have two uh, in place with North American utilities for up to four and a half uh, million pounds, right? Right. That will that that would match annual production number from the feasibility study. Uh, or no, but over... that's over a five to six year period. So it's about seven hundred thousand pounds a year right now. Okay. So we need we need to have at least a million and a half pounds a year of of, of sales in order to uh, you know cover your bank costs. Yeah, yeah. My question was uh, actually, do you believe that you will achieve higher prices in the next uh, offtake agreements? Well, that's hard to say, Lucian. <laughs> yes, of course, but uh, I mean, uh, you have provided I, I think, the information listen, the price... to the bank that the project is going forward and that you have offtake agreements in place. That, that, that was the hard part. And now it's it's much easier. I don't know, maybe I, I got, got this wrong. Uh, your negotiation position is maybe a little bit improved after you signed these two agreements. Am I seeing this right? Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. Number one is that uh, once we have the bank terms announced, yeah. You will have other utilities wanting to sign agreements with us. Yeah. So these first two utilities, of course, they like to support new developers. They're they're seeing a little bit into the future as to, you know, where are they going to source their uranium? Yeah. So it shows a lot of faith in the project. Uh, they did a lot of due diligence, and they signed these agreements. So they're now definitive agreements. We we need mm -hmm. to start supplying those in 2025. Once okay. we have the bank terms announced, there should be others that come in. And from my point of view, the uranium price has been very nicely, steadily going up. No spikes. It's just a nice, steady rise in uranium price. I think that's going to continue. Okay. So the idea that we have is that we would layer in contracts over a period of time and we expect that the prices will be higher as we sign on new people. Got it. Uh, one question. So Mida is governed by a board of director, the di directors comprised of six representatives. It's uh, four from the company and uh, two from, from the government, right? No, it's actually six from Global Atomic and oh. three from the government. 
story. Sorry. I have meaning to ask you, how would you describe your cooperation with the government? Uh, how well, often do you meet? No, it's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. We we uh, we meet with the mines minister regularly. We uh, we meet with the president if required. Yeah, uh, he's a new president. He was elect elected recently in Niger. It's a democratic country. They have a presidential election every four years, the same as the United States. Yeah, the president is is engaged for two terms maximum. So after eight years, they have to leave. Um, so no, we, we, uh, you know, I've been in Niger now 18 years. So, you know, we, we meet regularly with the government and of course, uh, they're really our partner on this project. So they like to be kept up to date and we have board meetings, uh, at least a couple of times a year. And, uh, if there's special requirements for a meeting, we call a meeting and we all get together and everybody is up to date. So it's a great cooperation. That's good. Very to know. good cooperation. Yes. Okay. I have a question from one of my followers. Uh, he would like to know more about your thoughts on potential dividend from uh, after DASA goes into production in 2025. Uh, will there be dividends from sh for shareholders, and uh, from which year you expect expect to pay dividend? Well, you know what, Lucian, if the uranium price goes to $100 and yeah. we can pay the bank off in uh, one or two years, yeah, then we will start paying dividends. Okay. I I like dividends, uh, and I think that's why shareholders are here, both to make money on the stock appreciation, yeah. but also to get dividends. So this project, it's it's a company building project. It's a, it's an exceptional project, and it and it will be able to support a very good dividend. So uh, that is my plan, and I think that we need to have healthy dividends for our shareholders. But it's it all depends on when 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 the banks are of moved course. out. Better to pay off the debt. So we don't have to pay interest on that debt, and then you start paying dividends. Agreed. Uh, Stephen, you are familiar with most of the uranium projects in the world. Uh, so when it comes to project economics, how would you rank DASA at, on the scale among top uranium projects in the world, among top five, among top ten? Well, uh, you know, from a cost point of view, we're in the yeah. lowest quartile. Yeah. So, uh, you know, 75% of mines are going to be higher cost than ours. They need higher incentive price. Uh, our cost should be below $20, all in sustaining once we are up and running. Right now, the feasibility is showing $22, but I think we'll be able to improve that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is going to be a very profitable mine. Uh, there's just uh, there's nothing like it on the African continent uh, with with our grades and size. So you know, I mean, you asked uh, where we'll rank. I yeah. just looked at uh, a Kitco update uh, this week on the top ten uranium mines in the world. Yeah, I would say that we will be in that list. That's great to hear. Uh, can you give us an update on Befesa zinc operations in Turkey? Uh, how is the situation there? What are the plans uh, for the next 12 months uh, for that project? Yeah, uh, that project is running well right now. And uh, of course, we've had lots of downtime this year because of the earthquakes That's in right. Turkey. Yeah, yeah, The steel mills are, are not up to speed yet, so they're, they're not producing at capacity. Some of them are still shut down. So the the whole point with that project is, of course, uh, recycling waste from the electric arc steel mills. Mm -hmm. And uh, until the steel industry returns back to normal, uh, we are running typically at, uh, I would say, in the 60 to 70 percent range. So uh, lately, of course, the zinc prices come down a lot. So it used to be up at $1.60, $1.70 a, a pound. Uh, now it's down around $1.15 a pound. Yes. Uh, so that, that, of course, has had a big impact also on profitability of the project. 
but you know with this with this new plant it's ultra modern it's very efficient um, I've spoken to Befez about it they say hey you know what we're we're here for the long term this is a this is a 50-year plant uh, and uh, you know there's been ups and downs in the zinc industry so typically our costs are very low there um, but uh, you know this is a little bit of an exceptional year because of all the earthquake issues in Turkey. The other the other issue is the hyperinflationary economy there. So the accountants, uh, IFRS, they apply different rules to the accounting on the Turkish operation, which is confusing to a lot of people. And uh, generally speaking, the, the project has been very profitable since we started it in 2009. Yeah, and uh, now with this new plant, really the profitability depends on the return of the steel industry up to normal levels. I would say at least eighty percent. Then there's enough electric arc furnace dust available for us and for others that are in that market in Turkey. Right now, there's a bit of a competition for dust in the country. So what we do is we accumulate dust for a period of time so we'll shut down for a month's worth of maintenance we'll accumulate dust and then we'll run the plant full after that to maximize efficiency uh, until you run out and then you have to stop again so the the less stoppage you have of course in a year lucian the better yeah and uh that all depends on how the steel mills are running in the country. So as soon as they're back to normal, we will be again uh, kicking out profits to Global Atomic. Stephen, can you give us an update on Orano processing deal? Uh, but before that, can you please explain briefly what does this meal, uh, this deal means for the company, for those investors that are not familiar with that? Uh, well, good, uh, good uh, question. Uh, the uh, Arano MOU, M M Memorandum of Understanding, was signed in 2017, and we've progressed it now to the point uh, where really we're, we're working on uh, what would the sampling procedures be, uh, what are the delivery schedules, etc. Yeah. So the whole plan of that agreement was that uh, depending if the markets were there or not there, we would have an alternative way of starting to generate cash flow out of the DASA operation. So yeah. all of our material has been tested at Arano Somer Mine uh, very favorably. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the head office in Paris has to decide when they want the material as I mentioned uh, earlier, we will be in the ore and have ore available in 2024. Mm -hmm. So again, that could be another way to help finance any equity requirements or cash requirements from the company is to have cash coming in from direct shipment of ore. Mm -hmm. Now this, this MOU was signed for a limited amount of tonnage. So the idea was a half a million tons could be sent to Arano for five years or even three years if they wanted to receive it faster. But uh, they have not now yet finalized the agreement. So we don't know currently whether they're going to take it or not. Uh, I know the fellows in uh, in Niger, they would like to receive it because clearly it, it's much higher grade than what they are processing. It would be beneficial for their operation. Uh, we've also talked to Arano about doing uh, some synergies relating to importing sulfur or other reagents where we can buy in bigger bulk and save yeah. costs. So of course they're they're interested in all of that, but you're dealing with a government agency mm -hmm. effectively a government uh, company uh, and uh, it has to go through the entire bureaucracy before a decision is made so we don't know what the timing will be on that but we expect that they will want to have some ore deliveries in 2024 okay 
let's discuss uh, share structure and skin in the game. Uh, my first question will be how many shares uh, the, do you have outstanding? How many warrants and options? If you know the numbers. Uh, uh, we're, we're like round numbers, 200 million outstanding. I think with warrants and options, we're in the 220, 225 range. Okay. Um, so that's that's that structure. Okay. And, and how it's many... all it's all on our website. We have a slide deck there. So it, it, I would I would uh, mention to your audience that they should all go to our website, uh, globalatomiccorp.com. And uh, there's a lot of information there. There's photos of the operation. There's updated photos. There's YouTube videos. Uh, a lot of information that people should look at. Okay. I will post a link uh, of your company's website. Uh, how many shares are held by insiders? Uh, how, met, how much do you hold personally? Uh, I've now purchased uh, over 15 million shares. And uh, I do have also a couple of million options. So uh, that's that's my position. I'm I would say probably the biggest shareholder in the company. Um, retail or I would say management insiders probably control about oh I would say in the twenty to twenty five percent range. Uh, there's probably forty percent would be retail, and uh, then the balance would be institutions. Okay. Before that again is also also on our website on our slide deck. Okay. Before I let you go, I have a format in my uh, interviews with ten quick questions for my guests. They are called B and B questions: bullish, neutral, or bearish. Uh, I say, for example, I say some stock or commodity like nickel, and you say bearish, bull, bullish, or neutral. Ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. Let's start. Uh, lithium. Bullish. Uh, gold. Uh, I would say bullish as well. Okay, silver. Um, what is the mid middle middle range? What is that? Neutral. Not bearish, but the neutral. Neutral. Okay, copper. Bullish. Oil. Neutral. Okay, U.S. economy. I would say neutral. <laughs> Euro. Europe. No, neutral. no, no. Europe. Euro. Currency oh, the Euro. 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 Yeah. Uh, Euro neutral. U.S. dollar. Neutral. Okay. Tech stocks. I think uh, uh, they're they're probably going to start moving higher. So I would say bear, uh, bullish. Okay, and final one, Bitcoin. No, I'm I'm negative on Bitcoin. Bearish. Oh, okay, same here. Uh, that that's about it. Uh, I would like to thank you for being my guest, and uh, I wish you good luck with your company company's projects, and good luck to you in your personal life. Oh, uh, Lucia, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure uh, meeting with you today, and. Uh... Awesome. You know, we look forward to some updates in the future as we continue to move the project forward. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. All the best.